Mark 16, verses 14 through 20. I'll put it on the screen for the benefit of those of us in the house today. And the word of God today reads from the King James text. Afterward he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. Notice the Lord did not say, shall follow you, meaning the apostles. No, he said, these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven, and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere. The Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. Want to talk to us today on the topic, more than a message. More than a message. Father, we love you, God. We thank you, Lord, for the presence of the Lord today, for the encouragement that the songs of the church bring to our soul. We're reminded today, oh God, one morning I will leave it all behind. All the struggle, all the pain, all the anxiety, all the fear, all the worry will be left behind as we enter into that rest that has been promised the faithful. Master, the word of God must go forth. It must go forth in power. It must go forth in love if it is to be effective, if it is to not merely communicate but activate that faith in our hearts that we know today the word of God is able to create and is capable of multiplying. For faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Master, today, let this message, Lord, hit its mark. Let it find its mark, not only in our hearing, but in our heart. Let the people of God today realize their authority and their power in the Holy Ghost as born-again children of God. Help us, Lord, to receive this word on good ground that it might bring forth fruit in our lives to the glory of God and to the furtherance of your kingdom. We ask it all in none other than Jesus' wonderful, precious name. Amen. Praise God and amen. Many mainline churches today, many so-called Christian churches today, are of the mindset and of the theological opinion that the gospel is merely a message. That we just have a story to tell and that we're trying to convince people to believe our story. Well, Jesus Christ was God manifest in the flesh and he came to earth to conquer sin. He came to earth so that he might take possession of the keys to hell, death, and the grave. He came to earth to redeem us and all we have to do is believe this. 
All we have to do is believe the message. That's what the Baptist folk will tell us. That's what the Presbyterian folks will tell us. That's what the Methodist folks will tell us and a whole bunch of others. All they have to sell is the message. Well, I thank God today that I was not born and raised in one of those churches. I'm glad today I was born and raised in a full gospel church that preached the full message of uh, the Word of God that taught us that the gospel is more than a message. The gospel of Jesus Christ is a message that brings an experience. Hallelujah. The message of the gospel, when it is believed and embraced by faith, unleashes within us power. Hallelujah. It unleashes within us authority. It unleashes within us today uh, things that demonstrate and reveal God to a lost and dying world. You see, it's funny how that the God of the Old Testament was a very active, very personal, very involved, very interactive God. You ever notice that? The God of the Old Testament used to talk to people. The God of the Old Testament used to perform miracles. The God of the Old Testament used to do all these marvelous and wonderful things. That's why we know that Jesus is the God of the Old Testament. Hallelujah! Because He came doing what the God of the Old Testament had always done. Hallelujah! We weren't seeing a different character. We were, we were seeing the same character we'd always seen. The only difference was now he was no longer invisible. Now we no longer saw him briefly it, as the fourth man in the burning, fiery uh, uh, furnace. Now we didn't see him only briefly in a burning, fiery bush. Hello now. Now we didn't only see him briefly, but now rather we saw him in the flesh something in a manifestation and in a manner that we could put our eyes on and wrap our mind around and even at least begin to understand and fathom God revealed himself to humanity in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ but when the Lord died and rose again and just before he ascended he came upon his disciples he revealed himself to his disciples and notice the first communication the Lord has with his disciples upon appearing to them after the resurrection the first communication he has with them listen is a rebuke well Jason God can't stand lack of faith. Amen. The Word of God said, it is impossible, for without faith, it is impossible to please Him. You cannot make God happy if you're operating from a place of unbelief. If you're operating from a place uh, of, of anything but faith. Hallelujah. I'm here to tell you, there are hundreds of thousands and millions of so called Christians in our world today who are literally operating from a place that is not faith. The message of the gospel is not merely you need to have faith to believe. No, the message of the gospel is if you have faith to believe, guess what's going to happen? You shall receive. Hallelujah. Peter said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Jesus said in Mark 16, and these signs shall follow them that believe. Not may, not might, not could, not should, but shall follow them that believe. In my name they're going to cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. Hallelujah.
Hallelujah. So according to Jesus, we've got more than a message. We've got a product. Hallelujah. We've got something to sell to folks. And it's not just a message. It is an experience with God that makes Himself real to human beings. I've had the Holy Ghost since I was a kid. Thank God for it. Only God knows what I'd be today if it wasn't for the presence of the Holy Ghost in my life since I was a kid. That presence of God in my life in the manifestation of the Spirit of the Lord has made the Lord real to me ever since I was, you know, the old saying, knee-high to a grasshopper. Amen. My father used to get angry at everything. I mean, every little thing that went wrong in our house, it, it was the end of the world, according to him, you know. I mean, it was so frustrating because the slightest little thing that happened, and my father would act like we kids had just blown up the planet, you know. And so every little thing that happened, he'd come at us and he'd be angry and he'd be threatening, and sometimes he'd even physically scare us, pushing us up against a wall or doing something physical, holding his fist back like he was going to hit us. And I mean, uh, it was terrifying. And I remember one time my brother Michael and I were playing and somehow or another, I don't know what we did, but somehow or another we knocked one of the closet doors uh, we had sliding doors to our closet. Now, I know as an adult, I know that usually they have a floor dived in the center that kind of holds the bottom of the door. Well, for whatever reason, when my father installed these doors, he didn't put the floor guide in there. So if you hit the door just right and what have you, you could lift it up off of the track and the little rollers that come off and it'd fall off. Well, somehow or another, we knocked the door off the hinge. Now, I know that doesn't sound like much to anybody. Most people say, well, big deal. Daddy will come home, and he'll fix it, and it'll be over, and no big deal. That's not how my father was. He just screamed and hollered and yelled and called us every name under the sun and made us feel like complete morons and failures and screwballs, and it would have turned into this big, horrific thing even though it was as easy to fix as just rehanging the door. Well, I remember before I went to bed that night, I was scared to death. I said, Lord Jesus, Master, please, God, Lord, just please, Lord, fix that door. Don't let my father come home and find that door off the hinge because he'll have a fit and we're going to get yelled at and he's going to make us feel like garbage. And, you know, and I was probably at the time maybe seven or eight roughly. And all I remember is the next morning I woke up and the closet door was back on the roller and everything was fine and it was working the way. And I looked at it and I said, well, how did, and I asked my mother, I said, Mom, did you fix our closet door? She said, no. She said, I didn't know there was a problem with it. I said, yeah, Michael and I were playing and we hit it some kind of way and knocked it off. Mom said, no, I didn't do anything with it. And I don't remember if she even knew back then how to fix it if she did, you know. And uh, uh, long story short, I, I did a little investigation and my father hadn't seen it off the hinge. He had not found it off the hinge. And so I said, well, I'll be a son of a gun. I guess God answered the prayer of this little child. You know, the Bible said, if you have faith as a little child, amen. When I was 16 years old, my mother and I went out and bought a car for me because I had two younger brothers and I wound up becoming the chauffeur for my family. I used to carry my brothers and I to school and do a lot of running around for us so my mother thought it'd be good for me to have my own car and I was a dependable kid. I didn't do drugs. I didn't drink. I didn't smoke. I didn't crowds. I didn't uh, stay out late. I mean I was a very responsible driver and all this but my father being 
a narcissistic control freak. He had to control everything, and he did not want me having any kind of a car. So my mother, she and I went, and we got me a little old used car, you know. And boy, my father wasn't happy about that. And after a few months or so, all of a sudden the car started having some trouble. And uh, water was starting to come out of the engine block. And my father said, aha, see, you went out and bought that car. And I told you not to. And now it's got a crack block. And he was just gloating at the idea that this car was no good, you know. And I had to call the shop downtown in the little town I grew up in. I called the mechanic and he come up and towed it down to his shop. And he looked at it and he said at first glance, he said, yeah, he said, I hate to tell you, Chuck, but it kind of looks like you might have a cracked block here and all that. Well, I was just devastated because that just gave my father more ammunition, you know, to be hateful and be the way he was. And I began to pray and I said, Lord, if there was some way somehow you could turn this thing around, if there was just some way you could turn this around, I'd be so grateful. After a couple of days, Gaby the mechanic downtown. I grew up with this man. He went to school with my mother. You know, I told you, I grew up in a real small town in southern New England, so everybody knew everybody, and you know, and Gaby called me, and he said, Chuck, he said, I've actually got some good news for you. And I said, really? Well, what is that? He said, you don't have a crack block. He said, your car's fine. He said, somebody installed the water uh, pump wrong. And that was what was causing the leak of water and making it look like maybe the block was cracked and all this. And I said, really? Well, when I told my father, ooh, my father had a fit. He said, that water pump was not installed wrong. He said, I put it on there myself. So I know for I know how to put a water pump on. I know how to do it. I know I did it right, blah, 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 blah. So here he was gloating one minute, you know, over the notion that the block was cracked and he could hold this over my mother and my head. And then all of a sudden the tables were turned and it made him look like the fool, made him look like the one that screwed up. <laughs> Oh, I want to tell you a little secret. God's been real to me ever since I was a kid. Now, some of y'all might say, oh, well, that's just coincidence. Those are just coincidences that happened. Well, maybe they were. Maybe they weren't. Mm -hmm. All I know is that it worked out for me just exactly the way I was praying. Amen. Mm -hmm. I want to tell you something. We have more than a message of a risen Christ we have the risen Christ working with us. In our primary text today, the Word of God said in verse 20, Mark 16, And they went forth and preached everywhere. Listen. The Lord working with them and confirming the Word with signs following. They had more than a message. Hallelujah. They had more than a message. They had the living, resurrected, deified Christ working with them and confirming what they preached with miracles and healings and supernatural things. Hallelujah. Oh, I want to tell you something, church. When we're walking like we ought to be walking and living like we ought to be living and preaching like we ought to be preaching, we have more than a message. In Matthew 10, verses 7 and 8, the Lord Jesus Christ said to His disciples, And as ye go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now listen, verse 8. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely ye have received, freely give. Sounds to me like they had more than a message. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
Oh, to cast out devils, it takes authority. They had the authority, glory to God, to heal the sick and cleanse the leper and raise the dead. It takes access to power, and they had power, glory to God. Even before the Holy Ghost came, the Lord Jesus Christ gave them authority over sickness and disease and demons. But then he said to them, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth I'm here to tell you today church we have more than a message hallelujah we have power we have access to the power of God we have a living God working with us revealing himself manifest Facing himself uh, beside us in confirmation of the word that we preach. In Luke chapter 9 verses 1 and 2. Then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all all devils, not some, not a few, not many, not most, all devils and to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. I remember as a young man, my mother for a while, for about a year or two, had us in a Christian school that was run by a Baptist church in Waterbury, Connecticut. And boy, I mean, these people were rabid about not believing in a God of miracles, not believing in the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you know, all of that was just devil and evil and wicked, which is so stupid. But anyway, I'm sorry, folks. How, how you can call that idiot theology anything but stupid, I'll never understand. It's in the Word of God, and they did it in the Word of God, and to claim that just because somebody does it today, it can't possibly be God, that's just stupid. I'm sorry, that's just dumb. So what, God died? God went to bed, God closed up shop and decided, no, I was going to be a God of miracles. I was going to be a personal God. I was going to be an interactive God in the Old Testament. I was going to perform miracles. I was going to do these things throughout the New Testament while I walked among you. But now that all that's done, no, I've shut all that down, and now all you have is a message. Baloney. Baloney. And this preacher that ran this Baptist church and I attended their school, they invited this missionary lady to come in and speak. She and her husband had been missionaries to China for many, many years. And this little old Baptist missionary lady got up there. And she said, you know, when my husband and I first went to China, she said, we didn't speak the language. It took us years to learn the language, she said. And... Because we did not speak the language, she said, we would observe certain behaviors and certain things, and we understood what was happening from a very different perspective. She said there was something about not knowing the language that made our observation kind of more detached and, you know, a little more objective, you know. And she said they had people that would wander the streets and in these cities, and she said, and they would be babbling to themselves, and they would be tearing their clothes off, and doing all these strange and weird things, and all this. She said, and my husband and I looked at each other, and we said, you know, this, if I didn't know better, this looks a lot like what the Word of God talked about when people were demon-possessed. She said, all of a sudden, my husband 
began to get hold of some of these people. She said, and he began to lay hands on them and he began to rebuke Satan in the name of Jesus and command these demons to come out of these people in the name of Jesus. She said, and all of a sudden, she said, these people would be returned to a sound mind and all of a sudden they'd be speaking their native language uh, and communicating with their family and living in their homes again and doing normal things. She said, we realized these people were literally demon possessed and they needed deliverance. She said, they didn't even speak our language. We didn't even speak their language. But when we use the name of Jesus over them, God delivered and God saved. Don't tell me God isn't real. And don't tell me we don't have more than a message. Hallelujah. If all they had was a message, then their effectiveness in that community would have been zero until they were able to communicate in the language of the people and the people were able to understand them. Those people didn't even know who Jesus was. But when these missionaries began to use the name of Jesus in authority against these devils, the devils began to vacate the people and they were delivered and saved. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Oh, I want to tell you, don't you tell me we don't have more than a message. In Acts chapter 6, verses 12 through 16, the word of the Lord said, And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. And of the rest durst no man join himself to them, but the people magnified them. And believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes both of men and women, insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. There came also a multitude out of the cities round about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folks and them which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed every one. Ooh, sounds to me like they had more than a message. Mm -hmm. Acts 28, verses 8 through 10. And it came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and of a bloody flux, to whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. So when this was done, others also which had diseases in the island came and were healed who also honored us with many honors and when we de departed they laid us up with such things as were necessary meaning they gave them all the supplies and all the equipment they would need to continue their journey oh I want to tell you sounds to me like Paul had more than a message hallelujah sounds to me like he had power sounds to me like he had authority I've got news for you folks nowhere in the word of God does it teach that the power and the authority of the believer or the power and the authority of the saints has somehow ended and is no longer available to the church of the living God. No man. The church of God is supposed to walk in this power and in this authority until the moment Jesus comes. I could stand here today and I could tell you so many testimonies of miracles that I've witnessed that it would blow your mind. I, I literally, I can't, I tend to remember like certain ones 
uh, at the forefront of my thinking, but if I stop and I sit back and I start thinking about it, it's like one after another after another just starts coming in to my mind, you know. And boy, I could sit here for days and days and days. When I was pastoring my very first church, I was 19 years old. 19 years old! Pastoring my first church. I got news for you. We had more than a message. <laughs> oh, we had a whole lot more than a message. My God have mercy. I saw people healed. We saw a lady healed of ovarian cancer. We saw people healed of brain tumors. We saw people healed of, oh my goodness. I've told you the story before. My grandmother, bless her heart, she was a heavy woman, a big woman, and she worked in a factory. Well, one day I went by her house and she told me her whole side of her face was swollen and it looked terrible, you know. And she said, I've got a real bad ear infection. She said, the whole side of my head just hurts. She said, the doctor said, I've got to stay out of work for about three weeks because uh, I can't be in that noisy environment and I can't stick the earplugs in and stuff. She said, so I'm going to have to miss about three weeks work. And then she looked at me and she said, CJ, stands for Chuck Jr. She said, CJ, do you have your anointing oil? Because I always carried my anointing oil on me, my olive oil. I said, yes, ma'am, I do. She said, would you anoint me and pray? I've told you before how I feel about the necessity for people to ask to be prayed for. So I went ahead and I anointed her with oil and I laid hands on her and I prayed for her. And she said, you and your grandpa sit here. She said, I'll get us some tea. She went in the kitchen and put some tea together. She already had the water heated and all, so it only took a few minutes. She come back out on the front porch and as she was setting the tray on the table, all of a sudden she went, woo! And she reached up and touched the side of her head. And she went, oh, praise God. Oh, praise God. Oh, praise the Lord. Oh, praise the Lord. I said, what? My grandfather's looking at me. She said, I just heard what sounded like three loud claps, like somebody clapped real loud right here next to my ear. She stood there a minute and said, Oh, the pain's gone. The pain's gone. The pain's gone. And within 10 minutes, her face was back to normal. It was unswollen. It was returned to normal. She was able to call the doctor and get herself cleared to go back to work. She didn't have to miss weeks of work. Oh, I want to tell you, I had an aunt that God healed and delivered while she was in the middle of a uh, miscarriage. And she'd already, she'd had a couple of miscarriages. Doctor told her she couldn't carry any more babies. But she had become pregnant again. She was in the middle of a miscarriage. And she told me, she said, I've already begun to pass tissue. I've already begun to see the baby coming out and what have you. She said, and I said, when are you due? She told me. I said, well, Grandma tells me that you asked for me to anoint you with oil and pray for you. Is that true? She said, yeah. So she said, your grandmother tells me, everybody you pray for gets healed. Everybody you pray for, God heals. So I figured, I'll, by all means, I'll let you pray for me. She said, but I'm already passing the baby. I said, Faith, her name's Faith. What a, what a dichotomy there, huh? What a conflict of terms. I said, Faith, how far gone are you? And I think she was about like four months or something. And I said, so you're supposed to have this, this baby in five months. She said, yes. I said, you're going to have this baby in five months. Honey, I hadn't even laid hands on her and prayed for her yet. And I'm already telling her you're going to have. You know why? Because I have more than a message. And I knew I had more than a message. I anointed her with all and prayed for her. Long story short, five months later, she gave birth to a perfectly healthy, bouncing baby. Then she turned around and had another one without incident. Years later, 
She was divorced and remarried. She married a fellow quite a bit older than her. She figured out he's old enough. I don't have to worry about birth control and stuff. Well, she forgets. It don't matter how old a man is, you know. She was in her 40s. She was, in, I think she was about 41 or something. And lo and behold, she got pregnant again. This is going to be her fifth child. It's the second one after her miracle. She had birth in her 40s for a perfectly healthy baby without a minute's complication or a minute's trouble after being told she could never have children again. After experiencing um, miscarriage after miscarriage, but then... God touched her. And I'm here to tell you, when God heals you, honey, you're healed. It is a permanent healing. It is a miraculous healing. It is not one of these hit and split miracles. It will last. It will survive. And I'm here to tell you, that woman wound up having to get her tubes tied because she couldn't afford to take chances on having any more babies. Oh, I want to tell you today, folks, I have seen God perform miracle after miracle. Churches that I've pastored, now churches that I've attended. Brother Gillum's church, the church I grew up in for that matter. We had a reputation for miracles in our church. People knew that miracles happened in our church. People knew that people were healed in our church. We weren't Benny Hinn. We weren't big TV preachers. We didn't have television shows. No, we were a little local Pentecostal church with all of 100 to 120, 130 people. But people knew. I had a little Catholic lady, Brenda, call our pastor one time and ask him, said, I, I wonder if you'd pray for me. She said, I've been diagnosed with terminal cancer and I heard about your church. I heard that when you all pray that God heals. She said, well, I'm Roman Catholic and I'm not permitted to come into your church. Back in those days, boy, especially in New England, you know, Protestants didn't go into Catholic churches and Catholics didn't go into Protestant churches. She said, but I wonder if you all would at least remember Remember me in prayer and pray for me. And our pastor at the time was Brother Richard Babcock. And Brother Babcock said, you got it. We'll certainly hold you. And he went to the church and said, folks, we need to pray for this Catholic lady. She's got terminal cancer. She needs God to touch her. I remember we prayed for her. A few weeks later, all of a sudden, we got this woman visiting our church. And during the testimony service, she stood up and said, I've never done this before. I'm Catholic. I, I don't know how to do this exactly. She said, but I want to tell you, I called your pastor a few weeks ago. I told him this and so. I asked you all to pray for me. She said, well, on my last visit to the doctor, they couldn't find the cancer. They couldn't find a trace of it. They couldn't find any scar tissue. They couldn't find anything that would indicate that there was ever cancer in my body. Do you know why? It's because we had more than a message. We had the one we preach working with us, confirming the word that we preached with signs following. I remember when I started my first church, I was just 19 years old, and I was used to in some churches, you know, I'd see people go up and get prayed for and stuff, but they didn't get their healing. They didn't get their miracle. And kind of made me nervous. I was just a kid, and I said, Lord, I said, what happens if, if I pray for somebody or I anoint somebody with oil or I lay hands on somebody and, and they don't get what they were seeking? I was trying to figure out what am I supposed to say then, you know? And I'll never forget it as long as I live because the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, if you'll preach it, I'll do it. It was that simple. If you'll preach it, I'll do it. You preach the baptism of the Holy Ghost, I'll fill people with the Holy Ghost. Leave the rest to me. You preach divine healing, I'll heal people. Leave the rest to me. 
Don't worry about what's going to happen if it don't happen. You just preach it and I'll do it. So that became my policy. You know, I was like, well, okay, God just said preach it. So I did, and guess what? <laughs> I never one time had to make an excuse for God for why he didn't do what somebody come up needing him to do. We had people come to our church that needed deliverance from demons. They heard about our church, so they came to our church to get their deliverance because they couldn't find it at the church they went to. We had people that had cancer who had been going up for prayer in their local assemblies to God church for months on end, and the cancer was getting worse and worse, and the doctor was trying to convince them to go in for surgery before it killed them, and they were trying to believe God, and they heard about our church, and they came, and they received their healing in our church. Oh, children, I I want to tell you something. God has given us more than a message. But the problem is, if you're convinced all you have is a message, guess what? All you have is a message. Did you hear what I said? If you're convinced all you have is a message, then that's all you have. My Lord have mercy. But see, God convinced me through the baptism of the Holy Ghost. God convinced me through the word of the Lord that as children of God, we were in possession of so much more than a message. We had authority over demons. We had power over sickness and disease. Listen now. Acts chapter 19 verses 11 and 12. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. My Lord, have mercy. You mean he didn't have to go preach the message to people for them to get something? No, he didn't have to preach the message to them. He had power over sickness and disease. Hallelujah. He had authority over demons. He, he'd anoint a cloth with oil and, or a piece of his clothing and say, here, take this to them. And, and let them hold this for a while, he says. And I'm going to tell you what God's going to do. Amen. I know I've been there. I've sent prayer cloths to people and told them, here's what you need to do. Just do this. And God's going to take care of the rest. And God has given miracles. I've seen people who were on their deathbeds literally respond to a prayer cloth and be raised. And I'm not even talking about me. It happened to me. But I'm not even talking about me. I'm talking about people that we sent prayer cloths to who were on their deathbeds. Acts chapter 8, verses 9 through 13. But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the great power of God. And to him they had regard because that of a long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women, then Simon himself also, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, listen, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. So even a man who was dabbling in black magic was shocked and amazed at the miracles being performed by the preacher of the gospel. Why? Because that preacher had more than a message. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God, 
For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Notice he didn't say, in the message. Mm -hmm. He said, no, no, no. So where should your faith? He said, honey, when I was with you, you saw the demonstration of the power of God. Therefore, you've got something to believe in. You've got something tangible to attach your faith to. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Oh, we've got more than a message today. 1 Corinthians 12, 1-11, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Ye know that ye were Gentiles, carried away unto these dumb idols, even as ye were led. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord. This is important, that one three-letter word changes the meaning of this passage entirely. That no man can say that Jesus is the Lord. <laughs> Honey, the Lord means God. Plain and simple. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, is one Lord. That's what the Jews would say every time they go to prayer. The Lord, our God, is one Lord. Paul said, no man can say that Jesus is the Lord. Not that Jesus is Lord. Which you could, you could argue is simply a title. No, he said that Jesus is the Lord. And in Hebrew theology, the Lord is God. Hallelujah. He said no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all, meaning to profit the whole. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and the self same Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. So Paul's saying, this is not spiritualism. You're not having different things going on, you know, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, prophecy, tongues, tongues with interpretation, healings, miracles. These things are not all going on because different spirits are at work. Uh, my Catholic friend who wants to believe St. Jude can be thanked for this miracle and St. Mary can be thanked for that miracle and St. John can be thanked for that miracle. Wrong. Wrong. According to the Word of God, Everything that is done, everything that is done is done by the one Spirit, and that is the Spirit of God alone, so that God alone is worthy of praise. God alone is worthy of glory. God alone is worthy of being thanked. Amen.
because God alone is doing it. These things do not transpire because there are a number of spirits working together. But God, the one self-same spirit that we call the Holy Ghost, is performing all of these works within the church to profit the church as a whole. In John 14, 12 through 21, I'm trying to hurry. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father, and whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If ye love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments, and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. We have far more than just a message. Hallelujah. The Lord said, oh, no, 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 no. You, you ain't going to be alone. I haven't given you a message to preach. I'm going to be there with you the whole time. Listen, and I'm going to manifest myself. Hallelujah. I pray all the time for people that God would make himself real to them, that he would manifest himself to them in the same way that he has manifested himself to me and made himself real to me throughout the course of my walk with God, throughout the course of my life. You know, talking about miracles, I'll share this in closing. It's been a lot of years ago, I came to Texas as a, 16-year-old boy, February 12, 1982. I came to Texas. I stayed with a great aunt and a great uncle and my cousin there in Fort Worth, and that's when I began to attend the Riverside Church of God. Even then, I was 16 years old. I'd gotten myself my own apartment after... I just just about the time I turned 17, I got myself my own apartment. And one day my cousin, my little cousin Sean, was going to be playing his final t-ball game for the season. He was several years younger than me. And he was playing his final t-ball game for the season. And my cousin wanted me to come see him play, so I agreed to do so. So I went over to my aunt and uncle's house, my great aunt and uncle's house, so that I could go to the ball game with, when my cousin came to pick us up. My uncle and aunt were also going to go. Got to the house and my aunt Dorothy was laying on the sofa and her whole face, her whole face, not just one side, but her whole face was swollen. It looked awful, absolutely awful. For decades, my aunt had suffered with severe migraine headaches. Decades. I had heard about it, she had talked about it, but I had never seen one hit her, you know. And when it would hit her, if she was on the sofa and began to suffer the migraine, she couldn't even get up to go to bed. She'd have to sleep on the sofa for like two or three days because she could not get up off the sofa. 
She said her head hurt so bad that she couldn't even lift her head off the pillow. And so I walked in the house and my aunt's on the sofa and she's in tears and my uncle said, Chug, we're not going to be able to go to the game because your Aunt Dorothy's got one of her migraines that hit her last night and blah, 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 you know. And Aunt Dorothy, bless her heart, she was in tears. She was in such agonizing pain. And uh, she said, yeah, she said, I can't go to the game. She said, there's no way. She said, so uh, Jennifer's going to come and pick you up and, and she'll take you to the ball game. And then my aunt said to me, she said, CJ, do you have your anointing oil? And I said, yes, ma'am, I do. She said, would you anoint me with oil and pray for me? She said, I, I can't take these headaches. She said, oh my God, I've been suffering for these things for years. She said, could you please anoint with oil and pray for me? I said, certainly. I anointed her with oil, laid hands on her, prayed for her. But then my cousin Jennifer drove up. I got in the car with Jennifer. We went to the ball game. We weren't at the ballpark 30 minutes. When here come walking my great aunt and my great uncle up to the stands. My aunt's face was normal. The swelling had gone down. In front of stands full of people, she lifted her hands up toward heaven and said, Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. She said, God healed me. God healed me. God healed me. My great aunt passed away in the last year or so. She never had another migraine headache, not a single one, till the day she died. Don't tell me that all we have is the message. Don't tell me that the power of God is not real for the church today. Don't tell me that miracles and healings are not available to God's people. Don't tell me that the Lord is no longer working with His church, confirming the word with signs following. Because honey, I know better. Some who try to make the gifts of the Spirit and the Holy Ghost baptism things of the past, try to use prophecies of deceptive miracles and supernatural signs as justification for their doing so. The Bible talks about in the last days, you know, there'd be lying signs and there'd be uh, uh, individuals who are able to perform miracles and it will not be God. But listen, but those who work deceptive miracles do so to try and draw attention away from the Lord Jesus Christ. They do not use the name of the Lord. And they will not certainly give God the glory for that which they do. The church has been called to do far more than simply preach an ancient message. Calling men and women, boys and girls to believe. Simply because we say so. No, we have been called to operate within the power of the Holy Ghost. So that by God's Spirit, the resurrected Christ is made manifest to lost humanity. We do not simply speak of one who rose from the dead. We work with the resurrected one to do in the earth today what he did during his earthly ministry. We have been given far more than a message today, church. We have been given the mighty movement of God's Spirit, which operates in and through His people. We do not call humanity to believe our message because we claim it to be true, but because we present evidence of its truthfulness through accompanying signs and wonders.
Christ the Lord is alive and well. Come and see for yourself as he manifests himself by his spirit in the midst of his people. Oh, children today, we have so much more than a message. Hallelujah. Amen.